Hello, and welcome to a special episode of Contrabass Conversations. I am so thrilled to announce that Winning the Audition, the book, is now available. It's my first book in eight years, and you can get it in paperback, ebook, and Kindle formats, and links to all this are available at winningtheaudition.net. So here's how today's episode is going to look. I'm going to read some feedback from people about the book. I'm going to share National Symphony bassist and Peabody Conservatory faculty member Ira Gold's wonderful forward to the book. I'm going to read that to you. And I'm going to play you some highlights from the four-part podcast series, Winning the Audition, which inspired this book. And, you know, while the book... It's about auditioning, obviously, and the processes that successful auditioners use inside the practice room, outside the practice room. I really see it as a book about how to persevere and accomplish a task, how to develop and implement good habits. And these are skills that you can apply to anything in life, not just auditioning. So whether or not you're auditioning, I think that this is something that you'll get value from. And my vision going forward, this book began with a podcast series, but it became something quite different, and it'll continue to evolve over time. I just wrapped an interview with Caleb Quillen, who just won a spot with the Kansas City Symphony. I'm continuing to speak with bass players each week, most of whom have won at least some sort of audition, and I'm starting to talk with musicians outside of the bass world, like Rob Knopper of the Metropolitan Opera. So I definitely see another edition in the years ahead. I see this book evolving over the years and I have all sorts of ideas for related projects as well. I have a list of projects like this that's I think at least 35 different topics. So stay tuned for that. And over the next few weeks, you'll be able to find it in even more places like Barnes & Noble. I'm finishing up the audiobook version this week and you'll be able to find that on Audible and Amazon. And as these things become available, they'll all be linked up at winningtheaudition.net. I'd like to give a shout out to D'Addario Strings for sponsoring Contrabass Conversations. Thank you so much, D'Addario. I'm playing their Zyx Strings right now, really enjoying them. They're this gut-like tone. They're rich. They're colorful. They're great for pizzicato. They're great under the bow. They're designed, engineered, and crafted at the D'Addario String Factory in New York. And D'Addario is offering Contrabass Conversations listeners the chance to win a free set of strings. Go to ContrabassConversations.com slash strings or visit the show notes and click the link and you'll be taken to a form you fill out to be entered. So thank you to Dario for sponsoring the podcast. Really appreciate it. So here are a few things that people are saying about the book. I sent some advanced copies to people that I featured in the book that I quoted, and I got some wonderful responses. And so you're going to hear a few testimonials from people that are in the book, as well as some people that are not featured in the book, but that I sent an advanced copy to. And you know, if you have something you want to say about the book, you can absolutely email me, feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. It doesn't matter whether you're... 15 and in high school or whether you're a professional, if you have any thoughts you want to share, I would totally appreciate it. That would be wonderful. Feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. So Owen Lee, who's principal base of the Cincinnati Symphony, he teaches at University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, and he also teaches at the Chautauqua Institution in the summer. He writes... Professor Larry Hurst likes to say orchestras are the largest employers of musicians in the world. As a result, auditions consume the lives of so many aspiring classical musicians. We have all obsessed over them to the point of auditions becoming mystical events with their own lore and urban legend, that somehow they are one with some kind of secret handshake, studying at the right school, playing like a machine, selling your soul to the devil, etc., Jason Heath's new book, Winning the Audition, goes a long way to demystifying this frequently misunderstood and intimidating process. His book is the most thorough and exhaustive book on orchestra auditions that I've come across for any instrument. Through his book and his podcast, Jason has created one of the most invaluable educational resources available for classical bassists. And that is high praise for me. I'm Totally humbled to read that from Owen. Thank you, Owen, so much. I I really appreciate it. Lisa Chisholm, who's a performance and preparation coach, and she runs a website, masterperforming.com. She writes, 
Jason Heath has compiled relevant tidbits from interviews with top-notch players and major audition winners, interspersing them with his own approaches and experience. Part practical, part anecdotal, and part inspirational, this compilation is something that any musician on the audition trail can learn from. What I particularly like about Jason's approach is the idea that there is not one way to do things. Rather, he amalgamates multiple approaches with a wonderfully open mind. And thank you, Lisa, so much for that. Uh, Andy Rossidi, who teaches at Northwestern University in Chicago and is acting principal based with the Milwaukee Symphony, writes, Jason has done amazing work. What started as a double bass blog has grown into a treasure trove of ideas, techniques, high-level concepts, and history of not just the double bass, but music in general. In fact, the ideas he's collected and assembled cross disciplines and transcend music. There are useful ideas in here for everyone. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, Andy. And there are many more on the website, winningtheaudition.net. You can check them out. Okay, I'm going to share Ira Gold's wonderful foreword to the book now. So these are Ira's words, and thank you so much, Ira, for writing this. I deeply appreciate it. And if you know Ira or you don't know Ira, you'll get a sense of he's a deep thinker. And I was so thrilled to have him contribute this to the book. So here we go. I've come to change the way I perceive auditions now after over 30 years of musical experience. I no longer believe that musicians win auditions. Yes, it is a competitive process. You compete with yourself to better your playing, understanding and speaking the music, and ultimately a committee of musicians critiques your playing to determine how you stack up against the pool. I believe that the goal in an audition is to take yourself as far as you can go, This is the last round of auditions, whether the final round, a super final round, a trial week with the orchestra, a one-year appointment. When an orchestra hires you, you have not done anything at that point. It's like the MVP awards in baseball. They are handed out after the season is over. You play and perform your best, then a decision is made. Since you can't be a part of the decision-making process, there's no reason to worry about the outcome. All your focus needs to be on what you do every second of every day before the audition, the audition itself, and reflecting on your performance so you can learn valuable lessons to apply to future performances. Often I ask myself, how did I become a consistent performer and auditioner? It's a combination of a variety of experiences, choices, opportunities, and intentions. There are a few focuses to share with you, not only because they helped me, but that I believe all musicians should explore. There are also aspects of preparation that I've noticed in successful auditions as I've served on National Symphony Orchestra audition committees. I listen to music all the time. Sometimes it's the same piece over and over. Sometimes it's something new. The key is to pay attention to what you are hearing. Why is it interesting? Or is it not? How do you feel when you hear this music? What characteristics or stylistic elements of a piece inspire you? How can you explore the same sounds on your instrument? If you are auditioning for an orchestra, you must listen to every single piece, in entirety, with a musical score, and follow along. You have to know the piece by heart, almost as if you wrote it. It must flow naturally in your body at every nook, cranny, and turn of the piece. Once you hear and know the music, now you have a blueprint in your mind to bring to the instrument. Without ideas, practicing can be like writer's block or just robotic exercise that has no freedom. I made practice sheets for myself in my undergraduate years at Boston University. Back then it was simple. Make a spreadsheet on Excel and print it out. I would head every excerpt or movement of a piece with a target tempo, or TT, Then I would put tempi, usually starting at half tempo, one tempo per field in order so that I could visually see how many clicks on the metronome I would need to go from the slow tempo to the TT. I would decide to go up one click per day or some other frequency based on how many weeks I had before the audition. I would check off the tempo on the sheet as I practiced it to confirm that it worked at said tempo. Sometimes I would go backwards in tempi to revisit a slower tempo to see how things sounded. Eventually, the goal is that no matter what tempo you play something, you can manage the technique. 
Beginning very slowly helps your body to build efficient movement and choreography as you build muscle memory. Creative practice has been an evolving process for me, and more recently, it's become an obsession. How many times do we play a passage, then repeat it again, then repeat it again, then play it a little slower, then accelerando as we work back to tempo again? Then we tell ourselves, yeah, that's how it goes, and we go on to something else. This is one of the most inefficient ways to approach practice. It's not even practicing. It's noodling or just playing mindlessly. Practicing is a purposeful, diligent, organized, and efficient process to explore our technique and musicianship. One way to spice things up is to play passages forwards and backwards, or play it forwards but with reverse bowing, starting up bow if you normally start down bow. You could play a passage that is normally separate bowing all in a slur, or the other way around. If there is a bowing pattern that combines slurs and separates, invert it, turn it around, take the slurs out, put them back in, take the separates out, put them back in. The secret recipe here is that the music on the page can't play tennis or volleyball with you, so you have to play racquetball. The music is the wall and the ball is you. Only you can move, not the music. It's about trying as many different ways to play something or explore aspects of something so that you feel more at ease with your technique. If your technique is more intuitive and trustworthy, there's more room to be expressive and to share the emotions of the music with others. Another beneficial approach is to take any rhythm, measure, or cell in an excerpt and set it to your scales and arpeggio warm-up. This doubly reinforces your knowledge and trust of the mechanics that the music is asking you to achieve. So you've listened to music, you have the practice sheets that guide your tempo increases, and you're creatively practicing. Now what? Find out how you sound. Record yourself. This is a painful experience if you've never done it or gone long periods without doing it. We really don't know how we sound until we hear it played back to us. Through constant experience, recording and listening back to our playing, we can develop a more truthful perspective of what we actually sound like while we are performing. Over time, the more you record, the more you will understand about your tendencies, your strengths, weaknesses, and other habits that creep into the mechanics. Now that the audition is just around the corner, how can you get that real-world experience of what the audition will feel like before you are actually in the audition? Mock auditions, tons of them. Play for family, friends, neighbors, strangers, colleagues, teachers, anyone that is willing to be a sponge. It doesn't matter whether you get nervous or not, but it is more important that you are playing through without stopping and you are building a flow with the music. I always played a handful of mock auditions before every single audition. I played for my colleagues and I set up visits to orchestra and string classes at public, middle, and high schools. If these mock auditions can take place in larger spaces, preferably concert hall size, that's ideal. If not, even a classroom is better than a small practice room. The bigger the room, the better, because it forces the ear to hear our playing as needing to be clearer, more articulate, and grounded, both in tone quality and tempo. A small space doesn't yield these specifics as much, and since orchestral performance is in a large hall, you must get used to playing in such a space. The experience of playing in a large concert hall by yourself is such a luxury that if you can be totally at ease with the sound, projection, and dynamics, you are on track for success. I began practicing yoga while a graduate student at Rice University, and this was one of the most profound realizations of my life. The body is the most important instrument you will ever play. Without proper alignment, movement, and breath, playing an instrument can be a constant struggle. Injuries and chronic pain can become a part of who we are if we aren't careful. Once I became more body aware, more ergonomic in my choices of movement, and developed a desire to become body smart, my playing really took off. Sound and resonance became louder, softer, faster, slower, raspier or darker, and more or less intense depending on the musical style. There are no guarantees or magic solutions for success in auditions, but I do believe that there are core values and skills that all professional musicians possess. 
Once there is a confirmation of impeccable technical skill, including intonation, clarity and shifting in bowing, superb tone quality, and rock-solid rhythmic vitality, there begins a process of assessing the artistic qualities. Dynamic range, vibrato choices, shaping phrases beautifully and comprehensively, displaying variety of bowing and sounds as musical styles differ, and proper tempi are specific aspects of artistry that separate the extraordinary players from the pack. Though the training and dedication to achieving placement in a pro orchestra can take years, if you stay in an always evolving, learning and growing mindset, it can lead you towards your goals. Ira J. Gold, National Symphony, Peabody Conservatory. So that's the forward from Ira. And thank you so much, Ira, for writing this for the book. So honored and thrilled to be able to share your message with people. Now what I'm going to do is take some highlights from the Winning the Audition podcast series. So that was four episodes that came out in the summer of 2016. And these are just a few tidbits that I really like from this episode. It's up at ContrabassConversations.com and I'll have a link in the show notes. So here's some highlights from Winning the Audition, the podcast series. I guess everybody understands that prior to about 1970, before the screens came up, that it was who you studied with that was everything. Because your teacher had the access to the conductors. And um, they could usually make a phone call and say to whoever, whether it was a Reiner or um, a Schulte or whoever it was at the time, I have a great student here of... You're going to be in town next week with the orchestra. Would you have a minute to hear this kid? And that's the way it, that's the way it was done for years. Hurst goes on to describe the adoption of the screen in auditions and how it transformed the way bass was being taught. Of course, I think in the 60s and so forth, in the 70s, the ferment in the country just uh, got pressed into the orchestra business, and it was way overdue because I know at Michigan there was um, an African-American kid there that was a great bass player, and he couldn't find work in this country. He ended up in Nova Scotia as principal there because this country uh, just wouldn't, wouldn't even let him play an audition. So that was very, very necessary. That had to happen, and I think it happened in the, the 60s and early 70s. But once that happened, the whole technique of, of teaching had to go with that because you couldn't just run kids through method books anymore. You had to get them ready to be competitive in the larger field of uh, the excerpts. I mean, when I, played, when I played for the chair in Dallas, I played an hour and 45 minutes with the conductor, and of course it wasn't. I, I played two Brahms symphonies. I played three Mozart symphonies. And I'm talking about first and last movement and so forth. We had the time to do that. Um, of course, nothing, nothing was really perfect, but the conductor could get a real insight and overview of what I could do as a musician because of the time element. Of course, they can't do that now. It would be impossible to run an audition like that now. And not to mention the fairness factor and all the rest. I never played a perfect round, and I've never to this day played a perfect round. I don't think they exist, and also kind of not necessarily the goal. Yeah. Like, I think that, I don't think of, I think this sounds like a like a bumper, like an inspirational bumper sticker, but I do <laughs> genuinely not feel any different about my prepping and my performing of an audition versus a recital, except I don't get to choose the music, and there are very small parts of a whole, both like one voice of a whole and one small excerpt. But I think that that is the most key aspect of audition preparation and performance is that, and having sat on audition panels here in Houston too, on several, it's, it's a musical expression and it's a little strange environment and it's weird and getting comfortable with the screen, but, but it is, it has to be a musical expression in an artistic endeavor. And I think most also just in the fact that, look, this is something that everybody's going to do for probably a time measured in years. And that sort of makes it potable, but also exciting and fun and, and rewarding, artistically rewarding. So I don't think it has, it's not a scan for not, you know, it's, it's like we, we work in a field where you don't get jobs with scan, scan tests or IC, you know, FAT tests or job interviews, 
I just think that even if you have to trick yourself a little bit, mm-hmm. fool yourself a little bit, I think the more that one thinks of an audition like a recital, the better it's going to be for everybody involved. My experience with students has been is that they, they vastly underestimate how much practice it takes to accomplish this sort of thing, especially when you're preparing for something as nerve-wracking as an audition. And, and they'll often say, yes, no, I understand, and they, you know, I'll point it out to them, and I'll even make, I'll draw diagrams and lessons and things, and this is what you need to do. And they shake their head, yes. And then they go play the audition, and they come back and they say, I vastly underestimated how much practice it takes. <laughs> One thing I learned over time was that playing things at Half tempo is a really amazing way to get very, I would say, intimate with each move mm-hmm. in any particular excerpt. If we're talking excerpts here. What I soon learned was that when I put things at half tempo, I had to make sure that I wasn't practicing different moves than what would happen at live tempo, real tempo. I had to make sure I wasn't using more bow or I wasn't using a, a, a slower bow or anything Um, I was increasing the gap between each move, Mm -hmm. kind of practicing in slow motion. That was a big way to get some of this stuff to stand up when you get under pressure. When you've gotten used to observing something in slow motion and relaxed and and very precise, you're telling your body over and over again, this is what it feels like to play this stuff. I think that our bodies don't really remember speed of something so much as their place in space and time. So if you play with your body in the right place and at the right rate, it's like watching sprinters practicing getting out of the block. They do it really slow because they want to see, oh, my elbow kicked out a little bit. That's going to take, that's going to add a microsecond to my time. Their body remembers the position more than it does the speed. And so that, that was a big breakthrough as far as being able to sit down and play. And even though I was playing faster, in my mind, I still felt like it was slower and relaxed. And I had the space, you know, that hyper-awareness that you feel in an audition that often would feels like a detriment. Oh my God, I just heard, oh, you know, you're aware of every, every time you blink and oh my God, the, the, the hair on the, on the string moved a little bit and I hear, you know, it's, it changes it from that kind of panicked, uncomfortable feeling to this extra space that you can sit in and I don't know, whatever the zone or the flow. And you actually have space to phrase or to mm-hmm. to feel this gesture and to hear this crescendo and this stuff. And it's very it's very liberating. It's a good place to be. You know, the word practice kind of has a mindless connotation for a lot of people, which I think is really bad. Um, this is actually a, a kind of a Bud Herseth quote. You know, the never practice, always perform. Mm-hmm. Uh, My piano teacher used to tell me this too when I would sometimes come into a lesson and play something a little uninspired. Uh, She said that I had a musical button. And so she would just push my musical button. And, you know, it's kind of that thing where, like, you engage and you start to... Maybe it's like a right brain, left brain thing. But you always want to have that button turned on whether you're playing scales and some andal or you're playing the Kuzovitsky concerto, you want to be performing all the time. You know, breaking your practice up into smaller chunks is really effective. I love David Moore's idea of, I think he recommends like 50 minute uh, practice sessions. You know, uh, you can even set a timer. I think that's a really great number. There is a well-known phrase that I always like to use with my students: is when you're, when you're in the, when you're building your performance, you're 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 getting ready to perform, and you're practicing as if you're performing. What you need to do is you need to imagine that you are, when you're in the practice room, you you need to imagine or visualize what it's like to be, whether where it is, if it's in an audition, you know, you gotta you gotta imagine being behind the screen, in a darkened hall, uh, you know, having walked down a long hallway first before you uh, play, having to play this audition. You have to imagine that. You have to imagine this from your practice room setting. And then when you're in the audition or the recital or whatever, you have to imagine that you're back in your practice room.
in my preparation, I was I, I, I would wake up every morning at seven o'clock and do my technical routine, get it out of the way first thing in the morning. I'd be done by eight thirty, and and then actually when I was preparing for for the Cleveland audition, I, I had a job with the Seattle Symphony and I had a baby, and so oh. I had to find a way to work that into my life. And so any student that tells me that they can't find time to practice, I, I just don't buy it because I know you have classes, I know you have final exams and everything else, but that's just not. That that's not as busy as having a child, mm-hmm. <laughs> and 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 having a job too. So I and because I've been I've been in both of those places. So um, I, I I would um, I'd go to my morning rehearsal that morning. You know, if you're a student, you go you go to your classes in the morning, and then I would practice from two to three thirty in the afternoon, unless I had a, a rehearsal in the afternoon, and I, I would really break it down and break down my excerpts instead of just running through things, just sort of pounding them out. I I hate the idea of pounding out excerpts. And I just uh, I would really take them apart and, and work on them little bits at a time, and um, maybe spend you know 10 15 minutes on on the more difficult ones, maybe five minutes even on a, on a small snippet of something. Say like um, I, I remember the Marriage of Figaro. It was on my audition uh, for Cleveland, and so I'm not going to spend 45 minutes working on that. You know, just take it apart into bowing and rhythm patterns. And and I, not even bothering to play it through necessarily, mm-hmm. and and then in the evening I would practice from seven to eight thirty doing the same thing, and um, focusing actually a little more on my solo at that time, just to sort of mix it up a little bit and keep my mind as fresh as I could, and, and so I've had three sessions of an hour and a half, uh, you know, unless I had a concert, you know, then I couldn't couldn't do that, and um, four and a half hours a day is of really focused practice, is a really that's really enough time, and mm-hmm. and I, I find too that breaking it up that way, that I, I was always fresh physically and mentally for the next session. I couldn't wait to get to the next session because I, I wouldn't ever wear myself down. So to this day, I never practice more than an hour and a half at a time. Starting the first day of my prep, I'm going to put the metronome on 60 and play each note of that list at 60, so just one note per second of the entire list. I might make amendments to that if there's a bunch of complete works, Mm -hmm. but for the lyric list for, oh boy, since October, almost every single day I've been playing each note of that entire list at, like, let's say each note is a quarter note, quarter note 60, for almost three months. And that just helps you solidify the pitch because you can can play something in tune slowly it's going to be better in tune fast. The, the opposite is not true at all. The tuning is still happening every single day, even the morning of the lyric finals. I tune the whole list start to finish. Yeah, so that's what my preparation looks like. When you get to the finals, you can do those fundamental things and then just add that extra sort of artistry. That's what we're looking for, you know, um, a person who can play a beautiful phrase, a person who can who can sustain a musical line. We hear a lot of skilled players who make it to the finals, but but then their playing sounds like if they were speaking like this, you know what I mean? It's sort of like word for word to word, you know, like like note to note, you know, it's very notey playing. And so stringing words together to make sentences and, and paragraphs and phrases, you know. Mm-hmm. So what's yeah, the fundamentals, make sure what make sure that you're your playing communicates. It's, it's like your speech. It doesn't sound word to word. It, it, and there's a sense of line and narrative that eliminates so many people from auditions. You know, um, you know, just the, the inability to sustain a phrase and to string notes together. You know, into a musical line. And it doesn't matter if you're a timpanist or an oboist or a, or, a, or a bass player. I mean, I've heard it all in uh, in audition. You know, you know, serving on audition, audition committees. You know, we we look for that artistry. You know. And then beyond that, you know, once once you have that skill, then it's a, a matter of imagination. Okay, what what is this story trying to tell? You know, I mean, like I remember being going to master classes with William Prussell, you know, the Cosmos of Cleveland, going to one of his master classes once when I was in New World, and at the time he was still playing in the, the Cleveland Quartet, and a violinist had played uh, played Don Juan for him, and it was this violinist played really really well. You know, I mean, it was beautifully in tune, beautiful sound. You know, everything was there. I think it was there. Everything and Bill goes, uh, Bill Prusa goes. Well, that was great, but um, so tell me a little bit about this guy Don Juan. <laughs> this is the first thing he said. <laughs> you know, and and so he and the students started painting a portrait of Don Juan. He's oh, he's handsome, 
he's dashing, he's charming, you know, and he's, and he's the son of a bitch. <laughs> you, know, you know, so these things, like like musical imagination, once you have the funnels down, when you have the musical fundamentals down, then you use your imagination, you know, try to paint a picture, you know, like uh, if you're playing Bait of a Knife, I mean, you want to sound angry. <laughs> you know, if you're playing, you know, the Hofner Symphony, I mean, usually when you hear the Hofner Symphony, it's so, it sounds like it's, it sounds like what it is, which is a complete pain in the neck. <laughs> but we forget that, that Mozart's, the, the spirit that Mozart is conveying there is a, is a spirit of joy. Or the Von Hall Concerto. Um, you know, usually when I hear people say the Von Hall Concerto, it sounds very, it sounds like what, what it actually is, which is, it, it's not easy. It, it's not, it, there's a lot of labor involved, but this is, again, this is like the Hofner Symphony. This is a piece that's full of joy and elegance. It should be like a glass of champagne, you know, it should be, it should be just it should be light and wonderful and sparkling and just it just put a smile on your face and you know that's that's one thing I think um, people tend to forget especially in auditions because I think a lot of people get into the wrong mindset that that oh it just has to be people are just looking for a machine just perfection just like a robot you know and yeah the the roboticism that might get you out of the prelims but it won't win you the job because because if you're playing like a robot you're going to be there in the finals with about ten to twenty other people who can nail the notes just as well as you are. But the audition committee is going to pick, pick the person, the guy or the gal, who, who is playing with that artistry. There's a letter that I still have in my, my base box today, and that letter is my rejection letter for the Philadelphia Orchestra Dublin. <laughs> um, and I keep that letter with me because I was so, I was just on the other side of distraught <laughs> for not getting on the list. But I always say, and I always tell my students this, every single time I take an audition, it's a learning, it, it's all, it's a learning experience, but two, it's preparation for the next one. Mm -hmm. So I tell my students, never look at the today, never look at the audition at this moment, because the, 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 these things are, are all a process of time. Instead, I focus at, at where I will see myself at the end. As long as I keep striving for that, I will make the progress I need. And of course, I'm being honest with myself and I'm getting the right instruction and all that stuff. Um, I can make the progress that I need to get, get where I need to go. There is such a culture of formality in music, mm -hmm. in following the rules in order to get to where you need to go. But then a lot of us don't get to where we need to go and after following all the rules. And I found that after going through all of the education that I went through, which, you know, by and large was awesome and I had great education, but I still felt like there were a lot of things that I had to take in, understand, and like, and reject in order to get where I needed to go. There you have it. These are some of the highlights from winning the audition, the podcast series, the book. Thanks for listening. Like I said at the beginning, this is the first of many projects like this. I'm really excited to get this out the door and get this to you. And the response has been great. It's been better than I ever anticipated. If you'd asked me four or five months ago, Jason, what do you think you'd be doing? I'd never say, oh, writing a book about auditioning. And th that, that was not even on the radar for me. But it's been a great journey. It's been a lot of fun. I see this project continue to kind of be a living document going forward. So expect maybe in a year, maybe in 18 months, who knows? I have no idea. A second edition. Expect this to expand outside of the world of bass. We'll just see what happens. I don't know. But I am so thrilled to put this out there. Putting a book out is so much harder than putting a podcast out or anything like that. It's kind of like taking all your ideas and trying to actually coalesce them into something, to a standalone document, which if you're somebody like me who's constantly putting out content every week, audio form, written form, blogging, that's uh, it's just like a river of ideas and thoughts and the dialogue continues and a book is like this standalone thing. It's like this mountain. So I, I remember why I was reluctant to write another book now 
and I'm remembering back to 2008 when I was working on Road Warrior Without an Expense Account, my first book. But it has been so much fun. I'm so excited to get the audiobook version of this out there. It feels very meta to now be reading some of the words that were from these other podcasts that I pulled in. But I think that's going to be a great addition. That's a little bit of a longer process. So hopefully that'll be out by the end of 2016. But we'll just see. So winningtheaudition.net check it out. Let me know your thoughts. Email me feedback at contrabaseconversations.com. Back to your regularly scheduled Contrabase Conversations episodes. After this, no more talking about winning the audition all the time, but thrilled to get that out there. Hope you enjoyed this special episode today. We will see you again soon for more life in the low end of the spectrum. 